Hello and welcome on behalf of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action to the launch of the Community Engagement and Case Management Study. We are looking forward to our time together today and for all of our participants who liked simultaneous interpretation, please follow the instructions that you see here on your screen. Most of us joining today from around the world have had personal experiences of volunteering in our own communities. Most of us joining today from around the world have had personal experiences of volunteering in our communities. We see a need, we hear about an opportunity to help our neighbors, and we give our time and support. This is a similar situation for people who have been displaced in humanitarian emergencies. Volunteers from Yemen to South Sudan, from Jordan to Colombia, are finding ways to help children and families from their communities in the midst of natural disasters, conflict, and most recently, a global pandemic. Often, child protection organizations are mobilizing volunteers and contracting them to support humanitarian response efforts. The question that prompted this project is when does volunteering become work? Further, what responsibilities do child protection organizations have to support, mentor, and protect volunteers? Our hopes during this conversation today is to reflect on these questions, to challenge some of our assumptions, and to think together of ways to act as a community. I'm Colleen Fitzgerald. I work with Plan International, and I'm the technical lead on this project. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Van Aken. I also work with Plan International supporting this project. I will be your moderator for the next hour and a half. Uh, which we hope will be interactive and informative. We encourage all attendees to use the chat to share your comments in Arabic, Spanish, French, or English. And we'd also like to invite you to use the Q&A function to ask questions that will be addressed in writing or during the Q&A section later in the event. Finally, we will be recording the webinar in all four languages. So in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic, and all four recordings will be shared along with links to the key documents with all participants um, attending the event. And we will also post them on the Alliance website following the event. So during our time together, we have four objectives that we would like to achieve. First and foremost, we want to make sure that we're providing an opportunity to reflect on the experiences, opportunities, and challenges of engaging volunteers. Second, we want to present the findings and recommendations from the research conducted over the past year. And we want to share the research report and advocacy documents based on the learning from the research. And finally, this is an opportunity for us to share next steps in the resource development and brainstorm ways we can take action. So to start things off, we would like to welcome Elizabeth Drevlo from the Bureau for Humanitarian Affairs at USAID. BHA has generously funded Plan International to lead this project on behalf of the Alliance. Beth, I, I hope you've, you've joined at this point and the welcoming floor is yours. And it's fantastic to see you all. <laughs> Goodness. Oh, uh, wow. Um, first of all, I just want to say what a massive piece of great work that this is and how fantastic to reach this point that we get to launch this. We at BHA are abundantly excited. Communities matter and are so very important in the work that we do, and in fact, are at the heart of the work that we do. Um, when we talk about why of this project, um, let's just go back and remind ourselves where do community volunteers even fit in? And one, we know that it is those who are in the community, parents, uh, trusted teachers, community leaders, uh, just people in general who are caring for children in their community, who are the first persons to know when there's an issue. They are generally the first person to identify a child in need and also are those who know community capacities and what is working locally to effectively protect children and to respond to children's needs. And so as humanitarians, we've been working with communities and really drumming the drum for community-based mechanisms and approaches over the years and promoting a localization agenda. This uh, project is no different. It's exactly in line with that. Um, however, at the same time, we recognize there's a fine line between what we ask of volunteers and what we need from 
someone who is either one more capacitated or two has been given resources for the work at hand. Um, and within the protection space, we also recognize there are a lot of ethical considerations in the work. Um, it requires a lot of one-to-one -one people centered work. It entails working with very sensitive issues that can also lead to stigma. It can lead to further harm of people, et cetera. So we wanted to look at how do we use the volunteers in the community to best serve children and where do they fit into the case management process and where do they not fit in and where have we per potentially overextended them. Um, and we know PLAN has worked extensively in communities, with communities, on the localization agenda. We know that so many here um, and those who've been engaged in the process have extensive understanding um, and embrace the idea of working in community and with community and for community. Um, and we just hope that this paper and subsequent um, work that comes out of this will really promote a even clearer understanding of how do we best work with community volunteers. So with that, I just wanna say a massive thank you to all who've been engaged. I don't even know everyone's names. Um, but I hope that we continue to recognize you not only here, but as this work continues. Um, and thank you again, Plan, for going with this project and to, yeah, and to the Alliance who are always providing the space for all of this information to be widely disseminated. Thank you so much, Beth. I'm glad we were able to sort out all the technical difficulties. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> I'm gonna hand it back over to Colleen. Great, thank you. Before moving on, we'd like to know a little bit more about who's joining us today. Uh, and we're going to try to achieve this by doing a Mentimeter poll. For those of you um, who haven't used Mentimeter before, it is quite simple. So we're going to drop this link for you in the chat, um, which you'll see. If you could just click on the link. And what we are hoping to see is um, where all of the people joining us today are joining from. So um, we're going to display this map that we have. If you could just take your cursor and pin where you are on the, in the world, um, we'd love just to get a little bit more of an understanding. Looks like lots of people in Europe, the Middle East, we've got some late joiners <laughs> uh, over there in, uh, Mongolia, it looks like we have some from Southeast Asia. Leticia from Cameroon, excellent. Yeah, if you're unable to join the Mentimeter, please feel free to introduce yourself as well, um, according to your name and which country you're joining from. Great, it looks like we have a nice spread. We also have some colleagues joining from South America. Excellent. We have a, a nice global spread here. This is great to see, um, including different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. We have Iran. Great. I'm so happy to see people joining um, because we know in all of these different parts of the world, we actually do have volunteers supporting children in humanitarian emergencies. Um, so thank you so much. So during our time together today, we'll be together for about another hour and 15 minutes. I just wanted to share a little bit about the summary of what our time together will look like. So up next, we're going to have a few volunteer testimonies. We're going to have a panel discussion with the consultants who led this research. We also will have a question and answer session. So for all of you who are joining, please feel free to use the Q&A function to ask questions for our speakers. That can include the volunteers who are speaking and anyone um, who is making remarks today. So we'd love to invite you to interact and to ask according to your context and the challenges that you see in this work. Finally, we will conclude with talking about next steps within the project and ways to remain engaged. As part of the research conducted under this project, we connected with over 100 volunteers. This included the submission of stories and photos from volunteers in 18 humanitarian response countries, as well as workshops and interviews in Myanmar, Malawi, and Nigeria. In the spirit of centering our project on listening to community volunteers, 
We are grateful to have two volunteers with us today. Samar, I'd like to introduce you to please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Hope you are all doing well. I'm Samar Ismail. I'm 24 years old. I'm basically from Syria, but currently living in Lebanon as a Syrian refugee since 2012. Uh, I hold a bachelor degree in biology from Lebanese University Beirut. Um, I'm now pursuing my master's two research in neuroscience research at Faculty of Medicine, Lebanese University too. So I start volunteering since 2015 in different NGOs, mainly Terre des Hommes, uh, in supporting uh, Syrian kids in their educational uh, classes. And I'm currently an outreach volunteer that deal with protection uh, with uh, InterSource and UN in coordination with UNHCR. So thank you. Thank you so much, Samar. And Shad, we'd love to hear from you as well. Please introduce yourself. All right, Shad. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shadwe Kabila. I'm from Malawi. I'm a Congolese by nationality. Currently, I'm in Zaleka Refugee Camp. Uh, I've studied for a since 2015, and I'm working with uh, Plan International, which is a child centered uh, organization as child protection volunteers. And I'm leading the Zaleka Child Protection Committee since 2019 up to date. And I'm having out some certificate in child. I'm sorry, Shad, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm going to let you work on your technical issues and I'm going to hand it back to Samar. So Samar, I'd love to ask you, what should child protection organizations know about community volunteers? So mainly our volunteering work here in Lebanon is to deal with the Syrian refugees and mainly the and our main concern is with the children. So we donate a specified time and care for those uh, vul uh, vulnerable uh, members of the society uh, through either conducting an awareness session related to child labor, ill remarriage, harassment and sexual abuse uh, besides uh, children uh, rights. We also refer cases related to protection uh, for our office, uh, InterSource, uh, in coordination with the UNHCR. Uh, during COVID pandemic nowadays, we also launch uh, and post the uh, post school classes uh, to assess them in their, in their uh, e-learning. We also conduct uh, entertainment as well as uh, uh, as well as training for those children in order to uh, to feel free and to express uh, themselves. Uh, beside all of these capabilities we have, we are facing now a day a lot of obstacles. Uh, unfortunately, um, mainly because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are not uh, able to keep in touch with, uh, with those refugees. We used to go for home visit, and now we, we contact them uh, via mobile phone. And uh, we still need more fund, more fund for, for mainly two reasons. The first one is to uh, engage more members in this uh, volunteering community to cope with all uh, Syrian refugees issues here in Lebanon. Uh, as we all know, there are uh, more than two or three million refugees here in Lebanon, and also to conduct more and more training uh, for those uh, for those volunteers. Uh, so I feel a very uh, great uh, happiness in, uh, in, in dealing with those children and uh, on keeping a touch in, in his or her uh, life. So thank you. Thank you so much, Samar. Over to you, Shad. What do you want to share with child protection organizations? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your question. As I said, I work with the Plan International, which is a child-centered organization. So as child protection, as Plan International, they are is to create a safe environment for to train within Zaleka to prevent and respond to different um, challenges or abuses that children are facing within Zaleka. So as child protection, we deal with uh, different cases here in the camp by handling these cases. And uh, also we do what we call the uh, referral mechanisms to make sure that uh, children are there and are referred to the right places where, can, where their issues can be um, held and addressed or also uh, take into account by responding to their issues. Because as I said, we are there to prevent and respond as child protection for all exploitation, abuses, or any child neglect that our children are facing within Zareka. So as child protection committee and child protection plan, we deal with the child headed house, which are children who left their home countries and then found themselves, I mean, child unaccompanied minors who are their home countries. 
and form the mission we are tired to ensure their security. So thank you so much, Shad and Samar, for sharing some of your of the work that you're doing. And we're so grateful that you're with us today. And thank you for sharing some powerful messages on behalf of volunteers. So next, we'd like to introduce our consultants who have been supporting this project. Sadly, Glynis, who is our research lead, is sick today, so she hasn't been able to join us. Um, but we also have our pilot country consultants, um, Kinza, who's supporting in Myanmar, Lara, um, who's supporting from Nigeria, and Bright, who's supporting from Malawi. We're so excited to have the team with us today, though we are missing Kinza and hope that our activities can restart soon in Myanmar. We're going to just start a little panel discussion. So while we wish that Glynis was with us, Colleen has grace, graciously stepped up to, to answer some of the panelists' questions as well that on Glynis's behalf. So Glynis, oh, oops, <laughs> Colleen, <laughs> we're, we're gonna start with you. Um, can you please begin by sharing with us what was the aim of the research? Thanks, Michelle. The aim of the research was to provide a better understanding of community volunteers who have responsibilities within child protection case management. For this research, we defined community volunteers as community members who were engaged in aspects of case management activities alongside NGOs and community-based organizations. So we didn't look at natural helpers, for example, or spontaneous volunteers but more specifically community members engaged formally with an NGO. And can you tell us about how the team organized the research methodology? Yeah, I'm really happy to share about the methodology because it was quite unique in the approach that we took. It was comparative in that we looked at evidence and theory and compared it with reality. Um, so we did a desk review of academic articles on evidence on what is effective in working with community volunteers. And we looked at that both from humanitarian and development perspectives. We compared it with the reality that we saw in the gray literature from NGOs, including SOPs, guidelines, trainings, um, and the gray literature that we looked at was shared with us from a wide range of local and international child protection organizations. From there, we did um, key informant interviews, 32 of them, with a mix of academics, technical advisors, and people on the ground, such as managers and supervisors of volunteers. And again, we compared that with the theory and the reality as described by the managers and supervisors. Then we looked at the reality through 68 photo stories shared with us directly from volunteers in the fields. And finally, there were four case studies where we spoke directly with volunteers and managers in six different humanitarian settings. So all the way through, we were comparing evidence and theory with reality. What we found was a strong correlation of findings between the evidence and the field research. For example, the evidence said that being aware of power dynamics between the NGOs and volunteers was key to success. Then we saw that reality in the case studies, which was very exciting. Thanks so much. Can you tell us a little bit more like, to introduce the humanitarian context that we have been engaging with under the project? Sure. So we've been working with three pilot countries. Um, we worked in Myanmar, in Maguey, Kachin, and Rakhine states in humanitarian contexts of internally displaced people, and in Maguey, which was an urban context. In Malawi, we worked in a refugee camp, and we're working in a refugee camp, Zaleka, and in an area of internal displacement related to the cyclone from about two years ago. In Nigeria, we're working in Borno State. We have a mix of local and international child protection organizations that we're engaging with for the pilot countries, and they're all doing child protection case management. So it's a really broad spread. The learning and interventions conducted in these countries are going to be produced as case studies at the conclusion of the project later this year. I'm really looking forward to seeing those case studies. So turning to the research findings and recommendations that came out of it, right? could you tell us what you learned about how power dynamics affects the work of volunteers in case management? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we actually did a study here uh, in the Zaleka refugee camp and also in the the die affected communities. And what was coming out was that the power dynamics is a key factor in ensuring community engagement, especially that volunteers are actually members of the community, but he recruited by an implementing partner. So we noted that he, they are actually a sandwich, a bridge between he, the implementing partner and the community. And yet uh, they are very, uh, 
they are supported, their support is quite inadequate. So what we noted was that the way volunteers relate with the staff members of the implementing organization is, is quite critical. The way they look at each other in most cases was that the volunteers um, are people that are already working in the community. So maybe they don't deserve so much support and yet the, the work they do is, is quite important. So indeed, we can confirm that power dynamics is a key factor that affects how case management issues are done by community volunteers, especially in the context where the community volunteers are in between the more powerful community members and also more powerful implementing partner organization staff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bray. So while we're still working on Lars Connection, I mean, I think we're all used to these challenges um, since we've all had to start working remotely. And this is just a reality of, of, the, uh, of, of having to do a lot of Zoom meetings, very challenging. Um, so we'll go back to Bright for another question. Bright, can you tell us what the volunteers, what do the volunteers tell you about how they feel ab about their work? Yes, uh, I, I, we talked to quite a number of volunteers in both sites. And the, there was uniformity in what they felt about their work. First of all, they actually like their work. They appreciate the important role that they are playing in case management, child protection issues. They, they work quite, quite hard uh, and, and in very challenging circumstances. Um, they felt quite, quite, quite well, quite strongly uh, committed to, the, to, to child protection issues, even with very limited incentives. But they also told us that the, they have frust frustrations uh, in terms of how implementing organizations recognize their work. They, they wanted more recognition from implementing partners about their work. They were quite uh, uh, curious about support that they receive in terms of training, basic, communication support, basic mentoring and office support, and also communication and feedback. So in general, they appreciate the important role that they are playing in case management, child protection issues, but they have challenges that they feel implementing organizations should actually uh, support. Also in the context that they are doing all this um, um, at the expense of their own household livelihoods. Thank you. That's that's very interesting, Bray. Um, I think we're still working to get Lara back online, but so could you tell us a bit more, Bray, about some of those personal challenges that you just mentioned? So what were the personal challenges that the volunteers described? Yeah, uh, quite a number of them, but uh, maybe I can summarize a few. Um, the, I think the most important one that they felt was the recognition. They felt like although they do a lot of work, um, uh, linking the partners and communities, their work is not recognized, it's not appreciated by implementing organizations. Secondly, they felt like um, all this work is not um, uh, remunerated or not incentivized properly. And their, uh, their issue was not about monetary incentives per se, but incentives that are non-monetary can also play a big part in their daily work. Uh, in the context of Zaleka, there was also uh, a mention about uh, the personal sacrifice that they invest in the work of child protection through using their own resources for mobility, their own resources to report and identify cases. So the support from partners and from the community was another major issue that affected individual volunteers. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Bray. And I understand from my from my fellow panelists that we're still having a little uh, trouble with getting Lara back online. Um, so, would you mind, Bray, just quickly telling us about some of the activities you facilitated with volunteers in Malawi, um, and what did you find out from the research about the roles community volunteers play in case management? As part of the research that we did here, we conducted a number of consultation meetings with government. Uh, with volunteers themselves and also with the implementing partners, management and staff. We also had to uh, uh, conduct special interviews uh, with implementing organizations, management team. Uh, 
Uh, and after the, the report was written, we had a dissemination a meeting with the Plan International Management as well as uh, management of the local NGO that we were working with. Uh, in, in general, uh, what was the, uh, coming up was that there's a lot of interest in supporting volunteers, but the, possibly what type of support uh, is, is, is an area which had not been really very clear. So that's what I can say about the work that we did with the um, uh, volunteers in, in Malawi about the research. Uh, the process is ongoing. Uh, I'm sure that I will still have another opportunity to share uh, with you the, the, the plans that are underway to implement the recommendations of the study. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Bray. And I, I believe that we have Lara back online. So before moving on to our next round of questions for Colleen, I would just like to give Lara an opportunity to share a bit about um, what she found from the research on the roles of community volunteers in case management and uh, what were some of the personal challenges that the volunteers described. So Lara, if you could maybe provide some answers to those two questions before we move on to the next section, that'd be great. Okay, I'm very sorry I got disconnected. My name is Lara Adibowali and I'm the research consultant working in Nigeria. And um, some of the roles um, that we found out community volunteers play in the community is the fact that community volunteers have a lot of integral roles that they play within the community. A lot of times you find them supporting um, referrals, you find them helping us as entry points to identify these uh, vulnerable children within the community. And then they support caseworker in the area, the, the caseworkers in the area of um, follow-ups, they support um, the child protection community structures to um, carry out awareness sessions within the community. They have a whole lot of roles that we cannot, we cannot exhaust. You will find that, that um, they, they support um, uh, communities in linking them to the various services that are, that, are, that are available within their community. So community volunteers are actually pillars within, this, within their different locations, and they are doing a whole lot of roles to support case management in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lara. Um, that's really interesting about how they are like pillars within their community. And I guess I'm wondering, um, with that role they're playing within their community, does that also bring some personal challenges? And so did volunteers share with you any personal challenges associated with the work they're doing? Yeah, very well. There were a whole lot of challenges with time and not permit me to really share, but I'm going to be sharing a few. One of the challenges that was um, really mentioned is the issue of poor motivation. And when I talk about poor motivation, I'm actually talking about low stipend for um, community volunteers. Community volunteers talk about the fact that their stipend is low. They appreciate it, but then they talk about the fact that it's not enough for them to care for their basic family needs and for themselves. And then another issue that keeps coming up is the challenges of retaliation and threats from um, community members for reporting sensitive cases, the pressure that comes on them from family members for not providing case management support for their own children, even when those children are not in need of the support. The issue of lack of um, provision of mobility by organizations, you know, a lot of them work in big camps where they have to trek all around to follow up on cases. So it's usually very hectic when they have to trek very long distance. So they talk about the issue of mobility. And then they also talk about the issue of unhealthy uh, multitasking that is leading to stress and burnout and also emotional crisis sometimes when they listen to very, very stressing or traumatizing cases. So this is, these are the little like you mentioned, but there are a whole, whole lot of challenges, but because of time. Thank you very much. Over to you, Colin. Thank you so much, Lara. That's, I'm very, I'm so happy we were able to get you reconnected so we could hear um, about the research you've been leading in Nigeria. So now that we've heard a bit about you know, the findings from the field research. Colleen, how did the country research relate to what you found in the global research? Thanks, Michelle. And thank you so much, Bright and Laura. We'll have time to ask questions, more questions to both of you, because I know what you found was really rich. So to answer your question, Michelle, one of the key findings of the desk review and the key informant interviews was that there's a mixture of levels of voluntariness of community members engaged in case management. 
So there were generally three broad types. We have on the left end of the continuum were what we would call true volunteers. And on the other end are paraprofessionals, or maybe what we would say uh, are caseworkers. And in the middle, there are some kind of volunteer who were paid an incentive or stipend. When we explored the three different types of volunteers, <laughs> what emerged was that the differentiation of the different types of voluntariness is usually based on things like education level. For example, many paraprofessionals have a secondary level education um, and they have longer trainings and they've spent more time on the job and have higher levels of responsibilities within case management. However, when we looked at the reality in the pilot countries, including Myanmar, uh, Malawi, and Nigeria, um, what we found is that the three types are not always logically applied. So one would expect that someone who's a paraprofessional uh, or high level caseworker would work longer hours, deal with higher risk cases, but that wasn't always the case. Often what we found is that volunteers with minimal literacy levels and training were being required to handle high risk cases and often working long hours. So these volunteers who had limited training, limited supervision, were really doing more of what we would call like type three paraprofessional case management work. Um, this obviously has implications for volunteers themselves. Um, it has implications for the children that they're supporting with families, communities, and with the effectiveness of the programs themselves. So what we began to see from both the global research and from what we learned um, in the pilot countries is the need to advocate for a team approach in which these type one volunteers work alongside caseworkers and power professionals and aren't given the burden for the majority of the case management on a day-to-day -day basis. I just wanna say a big thank you to all of the panelists um, Colleen for stepping in for, for Glynis and, and Lara and Bright for, for joining us. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> um, so just to continue speaking about the research itself and what we found is that even though community volunteers bring enormous benefit as what we are referring to as bridges, right, between the community, between children and families and NGOs or child protection organizations, um, very often the ways that they're incorporated um, especially within case management, is more com complex than often we realize. So there's issues such as power, choice, communication, and resources. They're not always thought through clearly when community volunteers are being engaged. The research shows us that case management is complex. We have many forms, we have complex systems, um, and the work itself is very sensitive, and um, you know, especially working with very vulnerable children. Um, and it really requires um, this kind of type three paraprofessional, highly trained um, and with a lot of support and supervision. Community volunteers need to be a part of a team that includes people who have training and supervision and can deal ethically with high risk cases. Um, we really need to question, should the case management approach be applied in contexts where there aren't the resources nor capacity for caseworkers to be well-trained, supervised, and remunerated? This is really a critical question that came up from our research. If we can't meet these core um, requirements of implementing case management, you know, what, what responsibilities are really fair to be asking members of the community? Finally, the last thing that I'd like to mention is that the research showed us that volunteering is deeply personal. It's a personal choice and that often the expectations placed on community volunteers affect their families, um, as Lara had mentioned in her comments. Um, it can also affect children and their communities in negative ways if NGOs don't think carefully through these contextual realities. So all of these points are really important from what we found in the research. What we'd like to share is that if there are only six things that you remember from our time together today, here are our key takeaways. Firstly, what we have learned through this research is that volunteers bring enormous benefits to communities and NGOs, but often they are under-resourced and overutilized to be considered true volunteers. Secondly, the mixture of unclear roles, lack of support for volunteering, plus power dynamics can lead to an unsustainable and potentially exploitative dynamic. Thirdly, 
Communities must be involved in all aspects of volunteer engagement, from the time that volunteers are selected, the roles and responsibilities that they're taking, and also with feedback mechanisms. Fourth, risks to volunteers, as well as to children and families, should be mitigated as much as possible. Fifth, we found that child protection organizations uh, and partners must coordinate in order to harmonize their approaches and standards for volunteer engagement. And finally, um, what we would like to emphasize is that there is an urgent need to invest in the child protection workforce in order to implement case management particularly. Um, this investment should be for community volunteers and for trained and paid caseworkers. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much, Colleen. So with this launch of the research today, we are very happy and excited to be sharing four key documents. Uh, these resources are designed to provide a better understanding of the research findings and offer advocacy messages and best practices. These include the exploratory study report, which is the full research report with the findings and recommendations for child protection actors in humanitarian settings. This report is only available in English. However, with the remaining three resources, um, we ha have additional translations available. The second document is a study brief, which is a five page document that summarizes the findings and recommendations um, for child protection work or actors in humanitarian settings. This is available in English, Arabic, Spanish, and French. The third resource is a policy brief, which is a three page document that's targeting donors, policymakers, and UN agencies regarding the roles of volunteers and how decision makers can support the role of volunteers. Um, this is once again is available in English, Arabic, Spanish, and French. And then finally, we have a poster that's on seven best practices to support community volunteers. This poster is for child protection teams to emphasize the evidence-based practices of engaging volunteers that were documented in the research. And once again, this is available in English, Arabic, Spanish, and French. <laughs> Um, so links are going to be shared in the chat uh, to these resources, I believe, um, and will be shared again following the webinar. Uh, please do feel free to share the documents widely amongst your networks and amongst your teams. Um, we really feel that this is a way to make the, the resources much more accessible. So for the last part of our presentation today, we'd like to talk about what comes next. Building on the evidence base that has been established from the global and field research, our team is working to develop resources to operationalize these best practices. This includes moving from research to action at the pilot country level. Great, uh, could you tell us what are the next steps that you are taking with the partners and volunteers in Malawi? Okay, thank you very much. What we have done uh, in Malawi is uh, basically to engage the management of the two implementing organizations uh, who have actually been very kind to locate to allocate um, uh, child protection teams uh, to to work um, with my support uh, to develop a, an implementation plan, which basically operationalizes the recommendations from the study, which uh, Colin has very ably uh, explained. So we have designed a participatory uh, process which involves a small team uh, of child protection uh, officers in the two implementing partners. Uh, we have implemented workshops, which are workshops that combine uh, volunteers and plan officers to isolate act actions that can be done to address some of the issues that we, the research raised. And from that work plan, a, a smaller task force has actually been formed to oversee implementation of the action plan. And for, for Plan International, we have actually moved further to develop uh, an, a monitoring and evaluation system that can help us track how we are going to implement the recommendations of the study. So that's so far what we have done. Uh, in summary, it is a a participatory planning process, which initially started uh, with the meeting plan staff and then meeting uh, uh, volunteers and uh, together uh, to develop a joint work plan, which we are now in the process of implementation. Thank you. Thanks so much for that summary, Bright. Over to you, Colleen. Great, thank you, Michelle. 
So just as Bright was describing, uh, what we're doing in the pilot countries is after this learning process that both Bright and Lara have taken and Kenzo took as well in Myanmar is to come back to the partners and to volunteers and to say, okay, this is what we learned together. What do we actually wanna do about it? How do we want to address some of these challenges that were raised? And so what's going to be really interesting is those challenges um, and those opportunities are going to be unique with each one of the partners and volunteers. So it's really a wonderful opportunity for us to learn alongside volunteers themselves and organizations themselves, which we're really excited with and very grateful to have Bright and Lara with us um, along that process. Um, so just to explain a little bit more, the process that is being taken with the partners at the pilot country level um, is going to be documented. So at the end of the project, we're going to be able to document the change process from what we learned originally to what changes were made by the team and with the volunteers. Further, these country processes are helping to inform a global toolkit that is under development to better support child protection organizations who are engaging volunteers in different humanitarian contexts. Um, this global toolkit hopefully will include a process to help organizations decide how to engage volunteers in their humanitarian context. Um, we're going to include resources, including some templates and tools and training materials. And we're really excited next to share that with the global community towards the end of this year after we go through this learning and piloting process. So really what we would like to emphasize is that this is kind of a complementary approach. We're learning from the activities that are ongoing at the field level um, and piloting resources. Um, and we're also you know, benefiting from what, what's being um, being addressed at the country level. So we'd like to share um, that, unfortunately, you know, we've had some challenges obviously in Myanmar. So if there's anyone with us today who would actually like to join in this field testing process, this learning process, um, we'd like to extend a, a, an invitation um, and please get in touch with us because we'd love to apply this learning in other contexts as well. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks so much, Colleen. So now that we've gotten through sharing all of these exciting learnings and developments from this project, we now have actually 20, around 20 minutes to answer some questions that have been coming in quite rapidly. Um, thank you so much for sharing your questions in the Q&A, and we are going to try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, let me kick off by asking um, Colleen really quickly a first question for you. Um, what are the recommendations from the research uh, related to the elephant in the room incentives? <laughs> yes, so I think um, with everyone we have spoken with over the course of the past year, this question of incentives has really been at the heart of a lot of um, the queries that we've received and some of the ethical issues that have arisen. Um, and so, we're not saying in our recommendations that incentives are necessarily a good or a bad thing. But what we're saying is that it's really important to carefully think through the application of incentives. What we've been thinking through is actually there's three key factors to consider. So first of all, we need to consider context. Uh, some contexts do not allow salaries, for example, uh, for, for refugees. So we know that this is particularly a challenge in refugee contexts. Um, but it's also important to look at other factors, such as the presence of other partners and NGOs. Are they paying incentives to volunteers? And how much is it? In our research, we actually saw that sometimes um, when new uh, NGOs are arriving in a context, sometimes they're offering a higher incentive. And thus other organizations, volunteers are moving between different agencies um, in order to get a higher paid incentive, which is really causing disruption in programming and there are implications for children. So it's really important to have this interagency coordination. The second point around incentives is the issue of sustainability. Of course, if a case management program can be institutionalized and transitioned into the government, that is the ideal situation, but we know this is not always feasible in humanitarian contexts. So we need to think about what is the sustainability of volunteer work built on stipends, uh, especially when NGOs aren't able to sustain their presence. 
So something that might be uh, an option is to consider livelihood projects alongside volunteer work um, as a better option. And finally, the third factor that we need to consider when it comes to incentives is the relationship between child protection organizations and volunteers. We found cases of assumptions that are made that with a small incentives, volunteers are then considered workers and are required to do long hours and deal with high risk cases because they were given some sort of payment. But the payment is not allowing them to support their families. Um, and the expectations of their time meant that there was no other time left for them to have economic activities and livelihood activities, um, which had very significant implications. These volunteers might be better off by being true volunteers and not being expected to work long hours and with very complex cases. And so that way they can support the NGO with their volunteer activities, but also have some sense of livelihoods. So the key really that we'd like to emphasize when it comes to this big elephant in the room, the incentive question, is to think through implications carefully in the context and look at all of these different factors. What we'd like to emphasize is that case management really requires paid staff, and it requires very robust and thoughtful training and supervision. And if we're not able to meet those requirements, we really need to reconsider the approach that's being taken. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks so much, Colleen. Sort of following along with that, I have a question for Bright, where uh, one of the participants asked, uh, what do you think the role of a volunteer should be in case management? Um, what support is needed to engage community volunteers? So, Bright, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I think partly the, the response to that question has been provided by Colin. I think the, the, the roles of volunteers need to be very clear, first of all, considering the context which the, uh, the, the, the organization is working in, the level of incentives that are being provided, and also the capacity capacities that we have invested in the volunteer. So the, the, the roles really depend on what type of volunteer are we dealing with. The more complex type of roles, including casework, should be really be left to people that are paid and that are properly and regularly and timely incentivized as paraprofessionals. While the less uh, type of work like case identification, case referral, those can be left to uh, volunteers that are actually real volunteers, um, working less time, uh, maybe uh, uh, more irregular incentives and non-financial incentives. What is important, as Colin has said, is really to understand the context in which we are working. We have also to look at who else is working with the same or the similar type of volunteers in our context so that it, whatever we design uh, as a, an incentive for volunteers is consistent with what others are, are doing. Because uh, we also noted that the uh, interagency uh, uh, coordination is key in defining um, the roles of volunteers. So that's in brief what I can explain. But I think the responses by Colin covers it quite well. Great, thank you, Bright. Um, the next question I have is for, for both Bright and Lara. So maybe Lara, you, you can take the mic first. But the question is, how did volunteers describe themselves? Um, and did this vary among uh, between the different contexts? So it'll be interesting to hear from both Bright and Lara. And did they talk about their expectations before they began working for an NGO? And I think there was also a question around you know, what were, were the roles and responsibilities discussed prior for, to engaging volunteers? So just to sum up, because that's a, a little bit of a long question, I'd like to hear from both Bright and Lara, with Lara going first, about how volunteers describe themselves, and did they talk about what their expectations were before they began working with an NGO? Over to you, Lara. It was quite interesting listening to community volunteers and how they feel about their role. I mean, themselves. Community volunteers here in Nigeria feel very good about themselves. They feel that they are contributing to a, a, a new thing, to the big thing. They feel they are supporting their community. And at some point, we, we, I had a particular volunteer who said that um, even though it was stressful for them, even though whatever it is they go through, they wouldn't mind because they are happy that they are, they are, they are contributing to, to 
to changing the lives of, of their community. So they feel very good about themselves. They pride in the work that they do and they're happy with it. Okay, about what they do before, what, what, uh, how they feel about themselves before and after. So we have examples of people seeing, volunteers seeing themselves as being very idle before um, taking on the role of community volunteers. Some of them were idle. Some of them see themselves. There was a particular volunteer who said she sees herself, herself as a bird that just moves around, all around without a direction. But then now she sees herself like a wall clock that is doing something very meaningful with every tick. So they see themselves before they became a volunteer. Most of them were idle, they, they weren't doing much, but now they are doing a lot of productive things with themselves, supporting children here and there. And I think that's something that is really very great. Thank you. I think Bright would probably like to add a little more to that. Uh, thank you, Lala. Uh, not much needed to add, except to agree with Lala that the volunteers are, are really motivated by very interesting factors, uh, including the mere fact that they belong to the community and they would like to contribute to the development of their own community. Um, they, they, they are motivated to, to, to gain uh, additional knowledge and skills. I remember two ladies I interviewed uh, actually grew themselves with a small head at the beginning and with a big head at the end, implying that they have gained quite a lot of uh, knowledge and skills uh, after uh, uh, serving as volunteers over five years. So they are motivated by potential gains. One, in terms of serving their community. Two, in terms of gaining their own skills and being recognized. But there was also uh, one lady in, in, in the other side who actually said to me, volunteerism is a calling from God. So I'm serving my community because I'm, I'm heeding the call from God to serve my community. So there are a lot of intrinsic as well as in extrinsic factors that tend to motivate these volunteers to continue uh, supporting uh, child protection issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bright. Um, I'd like to give Shad an opportunity to respond to the question that, that we weren't able to get to earlier. So Shad, could you tell us what is one message that you would have for child protection actors? Yeah, as uh, Mr. Bright said, uh, my uh, message to different uh, NGOs who are working with child protection is that they should uh, work hand in hand and to value uh, volunteers because they are there to make their work uh, easier and uh, make sure that their work, uh, their objectives are, are fulfilled through volunteers. So volunteers have to be considered. They are not there to make their, their work very tough, but to make it very easy. So they should always um, uh, uh, promote them and uh, value their work, not take their work for granted, because uh, most of the, the, the organizations are working with child protection always take their the volunteers' work for granted. So as child protection, you know, they are facing a lot of challenges, but my message is that they should invest more in, child, uh, in their volunteers, bring them more, more, more trainings for them to have enough knowledge that uh, will, uh, they will be well equipped to, to deal with child protection issues that are uh, um, the community or people that they are saving. Uh, once they are well uh, trained and well occupied, they can um, easily work toward addressing issues that are uh, the community is facing and handling them and make sure that uh, well, whatever they, I mean, the organization is working toward or uh, fighting for, uh, together with volunteers, they can. Uh, achieve that because um, they are there to achieve something and then when they are working together with volunteers they will achieve it and also uh, they should as Mr. Bryan said most of the volunteers are crying to, uh, to say that okay of course they are willing to do so as Mr. Bryan also enlightened that uh, someone can say that this is um, uh, a gift from God to volunteering but when you are doing you need also to be encouraged so you can't just sacrifice yourself where you, why you are not also encouraged. So they are parents. Uh, some of the volunteers are families in, uh, I mean, to, to support as well. So they should, the organization which are working with child protection should also think about uh, these people are working with them. Let's increase more incentive from them. Let's encourage them uh, not only to give them money, but 
support, moral support or psychological support or anything that can make them encourage to do their work so that they can achieve something. That can be my little mercy to different NGOs which are working with child protection. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Chad. I'm glad we were able to hear that message from you. Something that came up quite frequently was about power dynamics. So I would love to ask all of the panelists, uh, what are your key recommendations for supporting community volunteers to address power dynamics? And what can we do to mitigate risks to volunteers? So just to reiterate the question, what are our recommendations for supporting community volunteers to address power dynamics? And what can we do to mitigate the risk to volunteers? And I'd like to hear from Lara and Bright on this and, and Colleen, of course, if you would like to chime in. Um, but so over to Lara or Bright, whoever would like to speak first. Yeah, I think what I'll talk about, maybe one or two key recommendations. I think the, the first and foremost engagement between the uh, implementing organizations and, and volunteers is, is quite key. So we, we need to institute some mechanisms of collaboration between implementing organizations, child protection agencies, and the community volunteers, and, and regularize the communication between these two and address the challenges that each partner faces. I think there is a general disconnect between the child protection organizations and volunteers with expectations that may not be achieved in the current context of volunteers. So as, as soon as we and institute this mechanism of engaging between the two, we begin to, under, uh, to create spaces for each one of them to understand each other, to understand the limitations from each side, and then craft uh, ways of moving forward, implementing the, uh, the programs within the context of the expectations and challenges that volunteers face. That's what I can say at the moment. So, um, Lala, you can add. Okay. Um, one thing I'm going to say, just to add to what um, Bright has said, is the fact that, um, and this recommendation is actually coming from the volunteers themselves, so I think it'd be great here. So it's about um, proper community entry um, into communities by organizations. You discover that there's this power dynamics that play out between community volunteers and their community. Okay, so I, one of the recommendations they gave is the fact that organizations should do proper community entry, and that includes explaining to the community about what the project is about, and especially what the roles of community volunteer would be on that project with the organization. So I think that's one way, when, when the communities understand what role the volunteers are playing, what limitations they have, with the organization and you know because volunteers actually stand as like a bridge between the community and and the, and the organization so it will help the community not to expect too much or not to expect much more than the volunteers can actually deliver not to expect much more than what the community volunteers can bring as a form of support to them either from the community um or from the organizations they are working with or from other chapter or, or from other agencies that are providing services to the children who are vulnerable. Another thing is the fact that um, relationship must be built between um, CP managers and CP actors and the volunteers. Volunteers are also um, um, humanitarians at art, like someone said that if we are to look at it, they are the core humanitarians because some of them do not get stipend and they are doing what they're expected to do. So there is, the, the, there is this need for, for a very good relationship between the, the managers and the volunteers and then the, the, the volunteers and the community. There has to be that very good relationship. And without their, that relationship, there might be a whole lot of hiccups here and there which could really affect um, proper delivery of uh, the work. Thank you. Thanks, Lara. I just want to jump in really quickly, you know, echoing exactly what Bright and Lara have advocated for that we've heard from volunteers themselves. What we've talked about in the report is um, really emphasizing this need for a team approach in which volunteers are seen as part of the child protection team, um, that they're really listened to, um, and that it's not tasking them with doing things for in a one way channel, but also that um, we're learning from volunteers themselves. We're understanding the unique um, realities 
within their communities. So I think this other point of acknowledging their role, appreciating that without volunteers, we really couldn't achieve our program activities as child protection organizations um, and really listening to them and learning. So that way it's kind of balancing this top down um, instructions given to volunteers, but really appreciating um, their expertise from their community and listening to them and then adapting our programming according to what we learn. Thanks. Thanks so much, Colleen. Um, I think related to this, it would be interesting to hear um, from the panelists about whether or not uh, the research showed anything about how to best select volunteers um, and how can we make sure volunteers um, can, you know, remain confidential or, you know, mitigate those risks that they can face by be becoming volunteers in their communities. So is there any recommendations around this volunteer selection process? Okay, um, let me go. About the selection of um, community volunteers, there were a lot of discussions around that. Uh, we had from the CP managers and, and then the, the volunteers themselves. But one of the things that kept coming up is the fact that community volunteers have to be selected from the community. And then if we must select um, the best of the volunteers, we need to engage the community structures. We need to engage the, the traditional rulers and the stakeholders. So that way, there, and then we need to also hear from the children in the selection process. Children also have to be to be engaged because they are the ones these people are actually going to work with. So community volunteers, like I said, have to be selected from the community, and then um, it has to be on 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 a. Uh, there has to be a whole lot of fairness because we've we've actually had about cases where. Um, um, uh, traditional rulers or community leaders are. are, are uh, are called or are, are, are told about the selection process and then there's some sort of interference, you know, trying to bring probably their children or something, but then we should be able to, I mean, organizations should be able to manage that aspect, but it doesn't rule out the fact that the community has to be involved, the children have to be involved and every part of the community has to be involved in ensuring that we're able to select the best of the volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. I don't know if Bray, if you have any thoughts that you would like to add. Yeah, just just one 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 key point is that uh, at at the moment, what we found in the study is that uh, the system for recruiting volunteers is not organized. It uh, it takes several shapes, several forms, several procedures, and and in most cases, it's not documented. So um, part of the recommendation is to harmonize this and have. Uh, a process that is transparent and accountable and takes care of what Lala has said, um, engages both the community as well as the implementing partner. And in some cases, including government, because in the campsites, the overall authority is still the government. So that's part of the recommendation that he, I can contribute. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bright. Um, and almost as a follow-up question, uh, we had a question around uh, how education qualifications and competencies of volunteers are different um, and vary from context to context. Colleen, do we have a plan to develop any sort of standard of minimum qualifications and competencies of case management volunteers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an interesting question. And, and we do have to, when we're creating these global resources and guidance, of course, it needs to be very adaptable. So I think what is going to be the most important um, in the resources that we're developing is to first choose the appropriate approach of working with volunteers according to the context. So that needs to happen first um, with a deep understanding of the context. So we will have some sample, we're hoping to develop some sample um, terms of reference um, to you know, outline the roles that volunteers can be playing and especially the, the skills that are required. I think regardless of context and regardless of education level, what actually might be the more important thing to think about in volunteer selection is the volunteer's ability and trust from children in the community. So very often we're, we're emphasizing, you know, the ability to fill in forms um, and, you know, to, you know, submit paperwork, but really what, what is the priority in selecting volunteers is finding people who the community trusts and who children trust and have those communication skills. So we're gonna emphasize that more in the resources that we develop. Now, if we do have community members who are um, hired and uh, 
essentially employed as caseworkers, there does need to be a higher education level and skill set and ongoing training. And that might be a, um, a process in which volunteers might start on one end of this continuum in the beginning. And with time and with training and with mentoring and supervision, we might be able to help um, these community members become caseworkers themselves. So that's something else we can envision. Um, but what's really important is that if someone is responsible for doing, you know, that full-time case management, um, that they are given that proper training and that proper remuneration, as we've emphasized previously. I hope that answered the question. Um, I thought it was very helpful for the question. Um, I'd like for my next question are, is for Samara and for Shad. What were your main challenges in engaging with children and families, um, you know, in within case management and to ensure the safety and confidentially confidentiality um, and to maintain that principle of do no harm. So what were your main challenges um, in engaging with members of your community in case management? So uh, I think the main uh, main things it's to uh, to get the confidentiality and to to share what we should introduce ourselves uh, in a good way in order to uh, to grant to grant the confidence from those child and mainly from their family in order to ex express uh, express themselves because if if we are dealing with a protection case where there is sexual abuse or a harassment or a, 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 a like that so we should uh, introduce ourselves truly and uh, take the confidence from their family to express themselves Great, thank you so much, Shad. I don't know if you have anything that you would like to add. All right, um, as my colleague said, um, confidentiality is always uh, challengeable within Zaleka. Most especially, most of us are refugees. Most of the volunteers are refugees. Trust to be good within you and the volunteer. Maybe you can think that uh, this one is also part of the community, is a volunteer. So for me to trust this person, to release, to tell him my concerns, it's a bit challengeable. So you need to have, um, as you say, that uh, you need to have uh, enough knowledge and a basic knowledge about child protection, how you can convince a child that you will keep that secret. Because this is the most challenge that uh, most of volunteers are facing. because. This can think that, okay, this person is my neighbor. A child has come to you as a neighbor, but to win that trust that uh, is it this person is going to keep really my secret, whatever we tell him, whatever we are, we are narrate to him, is he going to keep it as a secret? So this is the first challenge that uh, as volunteers always first when it comes to confidentiality. And uh, now I think it's Mr. Bright raised it, um, documentation of cases. Uh, this is something also challenging because uh, for a good volunteer of child protection, you need to have basic uh, basic knowledge about child protection. Why is child protection? At least you know something about how I can document a case, how I can do about child protection. So most of the volunteers are not well occupied in terms of knowledge, in terms of documenting. So someone has come to you with the case, it's, you found that the volunteer is just ready to take the volunteers, but he's having the much challenge to document the case that has been reported to him. So you find that most of the cases that are, have been reported are remaining open instead of being closed because a volunteer has a challenge to document a case and take uh, the details that are needed for uh, further intervention. Because you can just take a case, okay, let's just meet a rating to an officer, but where did you document? This is also another challenge that uh, most of volunteers first because uh, that's how I said, uh, we need more trainings to know how, like having that basic knowledge to know how we can record a case, how we can handle a case, this can also be a good way. These are the two challenges on my side that uh, most of volunteers are facing. We in trust of uh, clients that are coming to us, since we're also volunteers, they will think of, okay, I will tell him my, my, my concerns. Is he going really to respond? Thank you. I think just uh, looking at the time, thank you so much, Shad, for that information. It's really, uh, it's really good to be able to hear from, from you as a, as a volunteer. And I just wanna say a big thank you to Shad and Samar and Bright and Lara and to Colleen for fielding some of these questions. Um, and I'd like to hand it back over to Colleen to wrap things up. Yeah, I think we could spend a lot of time speaking more and thank you all for your really thoughtful questions. Um, We'd love to uh, continue to engage on this project. So if you'd like to um, continue to 
share questions and, and contact us, we'd be really happy to hear from you. Since we only have five minutes left, uh, we'd like to invite all of you to take a moment um, as we're wrapping up to pause and reflect on the implications of the research and the recommendations that we shared today within your own organization and within your own context. So we have one last Mentimeter poll um, that we would love to invite you to participate in, which we're dropping in the chat now. And the question that we'd like to ask in this poll is one way that you will act upon the findings and the recommendations that were shared today. So one action that you will take following this webinar based on your organization, your context, we'll give everyone um, just a few moments to fill this out. Great, so we have better consult the communities and budget accordingly, revising the role of the community volunteers in case management, reading the document, sure. <laughs> we really encourage all of you to read the report. It is a bit long, but we do have that summary document in case you don't have quite as much time. Great, I'm really happy to see these responses coming in. I think this partnership with communities is really um, something that we would like to emphasize that I see here um, and having that kind of humble uh, relationship with communities and with community volunteers as well. Great. Thank you so much for your responses. I think we can scroll through some of them, Kira, on your side. There you go. Thank you. Um, more training for volunteers. Yeah, I see someone mentioning reflect the parallels with community health volunteers. I think that this, these implications from this research was very focused on child protection case management, but certainly I think standardizing approaches within volunteers from multiple sectors is something that we also need to think about um, and happy to collaborate with others on that as we move forward in the project. So I see we only have two minutes and I'm really sorry to have to um, end this. And if you have things that you'd like to add to the Mentimeter, even after we finished, we are going to be documenting all of this. Um, and I'm really grateful for all of your responses. So thank you all for your contributions um, and thank you all for joining us today. As we're closing our time together, we also would really like to thank all of um, our panelists speaking from multiple contexts and hearing your experience um, and listening to volunteers has been extremely useful. Thank you so much to the Alliance, to the Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs for funding this work, to Plan International, um, to our facilitators, our interpreters, everyone who was supporting this event today. And most of all, we would really like to thank the volunteers who have given so much passion and dedication to the work of supporting children from their communities. To appreciate and celebrate volunteers who are working across the world, we wanna conclude with a video, um, which is actually um, a video that we produced on International Volunteer Day, which was December 5th this past year. Um, many of the um, pictures you'll see in this video are from volunteers themselves. Um, so thank you to volunteers and thank you all for attending and contributing to this important piece of work. friend, a listener, an interpreter, a guide. They notice when we are facing problems and are the first ones to respond. They open doors for us and as we go to new places, they are right there with us by our side. They are appreciated in our community, working all day long for children like us. They understand and advise us. They encourage and support us. Sometimes they take risks for us. They are our translators and interpreters when no one understands. They help us solve problems. They listen to us in confidence and trust. They are beside us so we can be brave. They help us stay safe. They are far more than neighbors to us. They look after us, empower and protect us. They value us and we value them. This year, more than ever, volunteers have played a vital role on the front line of child protection.
Celebrate the value of volunteers on 5 December, International Volunteer Day. Thank you all very much. We're so grateful for your participation and have a wonderful day. Thank you.